This is the 16th video supplement for CIS 351, Grand Valley State University's course on computer organization and assembly language. This video discusses the carry select data. In the previous video, we saw that the carries created a bottleneck in the Ripple carry adder, limiting its performance to a comparatively slow big O of N. We addressed that bottleneck by adding hardware to directly compute each carry in. These carry in subcircuits can run in parallel, thereby removing the bottleneck and allowing a propagation delay that's logarithmic. However, circuits built this way tend to be somewhat large. In this video, we'll take a different approach and see if we can get that logarithmic propagation delay with a smaller size. To keep things simple, let's begin by focusing on one specific situation. Here we have a 16-bit ripple carry adder built out of two 8-bit ripple carry adders chained together. Hypothetically, if the leftmost adder magically knew what the carry in would be, it could start working immediately instead of waiting for the right adder to produce its carry out. This would allow both halves to work in parallel and would cut the total propagation delay in half. Well, magic typically isn't a good strategy when designing hardware. So how else can we choose a value for the left adder's carry in without doing some sort of calculation? Now calculations aren't bad, but we already explored that idea in the last video. Hmm. Well that's tough, right? How else would you get values other than computing them? Well, we could flip a coin. The obvious downside is that the coin flip may produce the wrong answer. And hardware that generates wrong answers is generally frowned upon. Now, we could check that answer, and then if it was wrong, rerun the calculation using the other carry-in value, the one that wasn't chosen by the coin flip. But at first glance, a guessing and checking strategy doesn't appear to save any time overall. Unless you take advantage of the fact that in hardware, you can do as much in parallel as you'd like. So, what if we hedged our bets and computed both answers at the same time? That is, compute one answer using a carry-in of zero, and at the same time, compute a different answer with a carry-in of one. One of those two will be correct. So this 8-bit adder on the right computes the least significant 8 bits of our 16-bit answer. It depends only on the external inputs, so it can begin working immediately. This 8-bit answer in the middle computes the most significant 8 bits of the 16-bit answer using a carry-in of zero. This adder can also begin processing immediately because it always uses zero as a carry-in. It doesn't wait for the carry-out from the lower rightmost adder. Similarly, this 8-bit adder on the left computes the most significant 8 bits of the answer using a carry-in of one. Again, it doesn't wait for the carry out from the lower adder, so it can also begin processing immediately. The output from the rightmost adder is always part of our 16-bit output. However, only one of these two adders is producing the correct bits that go in the upper part of that 16-bit answer. The output of the adder producing the correct bits, of course, should be included in the final output, and the output of the other adder should just simply be ignored. Now that raises the obvious question, how do we know which adder's output should be used? The lower adder's carryout tells us. If that carryout is a zero, then we use the adder whose carry-in is a zero. If the lower adder's carryout is a one, then we use that leftmost adder whose carry-in is always one. Now we just need to figure out how to put it all together. We need a sub-circuit that conceptually acts like a switch and connects the middle adder to the output when the carry out of the lower adder is zero and connects the left adder to the output when the carry out of the lower adder is a one. So let's see how to build this conceptual switch. We'll start by looking at a one-bit version. It has three inputs. A and B are the two values we're choosing between. For example, in the adder we're designing, we're choosing between the outputs of the two leftmost adders. S is the selector that specifies which input should be passed through to the output. When the selector is zero, the output should be identical to input A. And when the selector is one, the output should be identical to input B. Conceptually, the circuit is like an old switchboard operator who changed connections by physically moving wires. Of course, circuits don't physically move wires. Pause the video and see if you can figure out how to implement this circuit using logic gates instead. Now 
And there are several possible implementations. But if you don't happen to see any shortcuts, you can always fall back on the first video and implement the circuit directly from a truth table. When S is 0, the output should be identical to A. When S is 1, the output should be identical to B. This truth table gives us this sum of products. This expression can of course be simplified, but we'll save that for another video. The version here is sufficient to conceptually show how this circuit can be built. This circuit's called a 2 to 1 multiplexer, or MUX for short. The 2 to 1 means that it takes two inputs and selects one of them to place on the output wire. This circuit's also sometimes called a selector. We'll discuss multiplexers in general in another video. This particular MUX shown here selects between two 1-bit inputs. However, we need a MUX that selects between two 8-bit inputs. Notice that inputs A and B, as well as the output, are 8 bits, but the selector is still just 1 bit. We're selecting either all of A or all of B. We're never taking a few bits from each, therefore one selector bit is enough to specify what we want to do. Pause the video and see if you can figure out how to implement this 8-bit MUX. Implementing the 8-bit MUX is deceptively simple. It's just 8 1-bit MUXs running in parallel, one for each bit of input. I left out some of the MUXs in the middle so the diagram didn't get too cluttered. So now that we know how to build the 2 to 1 MUX, we have all the parts we need to build this circuit. Now notice here there's also a 2 to 1 MUX for the carry out. Now remember, the design shown here is almost twice as fast as a 16-bit ripple carry adder. All three 8-bit adders run in parallel, and an 8-bit ripple carry adder is twice as fast as a 16-bit ripple carry adder. And then we have the MUXs at the end, which just add two or three more gate delays. So now, what would happen if we replaced the inner 8-bit ripple carry adders with adders built using the same pattern? And by that I mean we take those 8-bit ripple carry adders and make them out of three 4-bit adders and a couple of MUXs at the bottom. Well, making that substitution would cut the time in half again. So if we kept going and again applied the pattern to the 4-bit ripple carry adders, we'd cut the time in half one more time. Which raises the question, how many times can we do this? How many times can we apply this pattern and continue to reduce the running time? So keep in mind that each time we apply this pattern, the width of the component adders get cut in half. We go from 16-bit ripple carry adders to 8-bit to 4-bit and so on. So what we're really asking is, how many times can we cut n in half before we get down to nothing? And that's the very definition of log base 2 of n. So, if we apply this pattern all log n times, what's the overall propagation delay for an n-bit adder? So if we do that, the circuit breaks down into a set of independent full adders, one 1-bit one full adder for each pair of input bits, connected to a tree of multiplexers. Each full adder just runs in constant time. It's just a single full adder. And all of the full adders can run in parallel because they're connected directly to the A and B inputs. So that section of the adder has a constant propagation delay. Each MUX also runs in constant time, but the MUXs are part of a tree with a depth of log n. So that tree has a propagation delay that's big O of log n. So you put those two pieces together and you get an overall logarithmic running time. Now, of course, the next question is, how big is it? So again, we view this adder as a row of full adders and a tree of muxes. And again, each adder has a constant size, but there's one for each pair of input bits. So that gives us a total size for the full adders that's linear. The next thing to realize is that the size of each n-bit mux is also linear in n. Right, an n-bit 2 to 1 mux is just n 1-bit muxes, and each 1-bit mux has a constant size. The trick is that the muxes change size. As you work your way through the tree, the, the muxes get smaller. So we have to figure out how to add up all of these changing sizes of all these different muxes. And we can do that with a recursive formula. Okay, so to see where this formula comes from, let's go back and look at the adder for a minute. The two obvious MUXs are the ones at the bottom that select the output. Remember, however, that we only need to select 
the bits for the top half of the output, so the size of the orange MOX is not n, but n over 2. In a 16-bit adder, only the top 8 bits go through that MUX. The remaining MUXs we need to count are nested inside of the three sub-adders. And each of these sub-adders has a size of n over 2. Again, if we're building a 16-bit adder, the sub-adders are just 8-bit adders. So, the total size of the MUXs in an n-bit adder is the size of the MUXs at the bottom that orange n over 2 bit mux that's putting together the final sum, plus the size of the muxes in all three sub adders. So in this part of the expression, we have a recursive term that's asking for the number of muxes in an adder of half the size. And at any given level, there are three of those. So then we can take this term, and this is what we get when we simplify it a little bit. Now, in order for this to mean something, we want to rewrite it in a closed form, which is just a nerdy way of saying write it without recursion. The math to do that is interesting, but a little too long for this video. So I will just say that there's a theorem called the master theorem that tells us that this function is big O of n to the log base 2 of 3 or in other words, n to the 1.585 power. Notice that this master theorem doesn't give us the exact function, but only describes it in the context of big O, but it's the big O we're looking for. And so this is sufficient to tell us that this adder is considerably smaller than the carry lookahead adder. Quick disclaimer, this big O size is for an unoptimized implementation. Just as we saw with the carry lookahead adder, it's possible that a clever analysis of the carry select adder will reveal some redundancies that will allow us to build it using many fewer gates. However, we're not going to do that in this video. Also, as with the carry lookahead adder, you can take a hybrid approach and only apply the carry select pattern a few times. Doing so will give you most of the performance benefit at a fraction of the size. So based on this video, you should be able to sketch the carry select adder you know, the high level and perhaps even drill down a level or two. You should be able to explain how the carry select adder works, like concisely explain the key ideas, and also explain why the adder, as described in this video, has a running time that's logarithmic and a size that's big O of n to the 1.5. In the next video, we'll look a little more closely at the trade-off between the speed and the size of an adder.